Hi, welcome back to Every Kid Can Play podcast, a podcast that uh, focuses on the kids that aren't always seen or heard in sport and physical education class. Uh, today, I'm super excited. Uh, I get to interview probably one of my longest lifetime friends. Uh, he's a PE teacher here in Topeka, uh, does a lot of amazing things uh, in, the, in the city of Topeka. Uh, my friend Nick Gardner is here with me. Uh, Nick, I appreciate you being here, man. Uh, I'm excited to have you on and just want to have you start and kind of talk about your journey from from Topeka and on your way to, to college and, and kind of what you've been doing with your education here in the past couple of years. Well, first off, I just want to say thanks, Matt, for having me. Um, I think what you're doing with the podcast is great. I listened to your first two solo podcasts and then your last one with Coach Parks, and you're putting a lot of good positivity out in a time when I think a lot of people need it. And uh, kind of Matt said, uh, we're kind of lifelong friends. I've known Matt since first grade, and he was actually my, I guess, first friend I met and, uh, when I moved to Topeka. So this is a really cool experience for, I think, both of us. Like Matt said, I'm from Topeka. Um, went to Barrington, same as Matt, Barrington Buffaloes, um, Shawnee Heights Middle School, where actually um, my dad was our, both of our principals, so that created a whole other dynamic scenario. And then in high school, I uh, played one year freshman football. Um, I'm sure Matt remembers that. Pika West game sticks out to both of us. <laughs> so uh, four years of basketball at Shawnee Heights. Uh, I would, um, then from Shawnee Heights, I went to Emporia State. And I think that's really where I began like my, uh, I guess, interest in education. Because I think if you looked at, you know, me, our man in high school, I don't know if you necessarily would think we'd be where we are today. Um, I really wasn't interested in school. Um, and it's just kind of that um, what my parents instilled in me. I, was, I grew up with two really, uh, I'm lucky, two parents that instilled college from the time I was a kid that they said it never was an option. It was you're going to college. And so I think a lot of times you put that in a young person's head that you're going to do something. They just do it. So I went to Emporia State. I walked on the basketball team my first year. And that, that by far was a great experience. N not necessarily because I didn't play, but I just saw the, what it takes to play at even the Division II level, the work ethic, and the, the time, and the different aspects that go into that. Uh, attended, uh, majored in physical education. And I'm, maybe I'm biased, but I think Emporia State has one of the best physical education programs, you know, not only in the state of Kansas, but in the nation. They do a good job, yeah, preparing us. Um, Matt attended Emporia State, I'm sure you guys know, a couple years later with the uh, same thing, Emporia State uh, physical education. Um, from Emporia State, I went on, um, I also received my master's in special ed from Emporia State, and I just graduated with my master's in administration last May from Emporia State. And so I think that college aspect kind of made me curious. And ever since then, I've just kind of run with my education and I'm continuing the summer too. I'm planning on going to KU to start my doctorate um, in education administration. And a lot of people ask me, why do I keep going back to school? Why do I keep, you know, getting another degree? And um, now I'm at the point now I really want to get it, not just for options in my career, but I think it helps inspire, you know, the kids I work with that you can do anything that, you know, I don't, in high school, if you just said, Nick, you're going to pursue a doctorate, I don't think I would have believed you. And it's going to be challenging, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but I think those type of things are help make us grow into better, you know, not only teachers, but better people. So, now, awesome. yep. So, to kind of talk about, uh, you know, your first year of teaching that, you know, obviously you were, in the quote unquote hard school in, in Topeka, you know, didn't have, didn't have a lot of equipment, didn't have any, anything going on with you at walking into Quincy and just kind of talk about how that has started and how you've built your program and what kind of culture and love you've brought in to your program to, to have this, I, I believe one of the most successful P programs we have in, in, in the district. So. Well, I appreciate those words, Matt. Um, like Matt said, I, I work at Quincy. I've actually, this is, actually finished my seventh year at Quincy. Um, and I, the thing, the, probably what I love most about Quincy is that it's only, it's around 250 kids. 
And so you really get to um, get to know the kids and the relationships. And I think that's probably the, one of the biggest reasons for my success is just, I've really taken the time to get to know all the kids. Um, you get to know the kids, their parents, you know, the cousins, brothers. And I think that helps. That's the first step in building the program. Kind of, I read Matt's, one of his posts this morning, he talked about relationships are the key. And it takes that time to build those relationships and the trust to really get things rolling um, from there at Quincy. Um, speaking about how to kind of build the culture within a program, you know, it's one of those things that takes time, trust, patience. The biggest thing, my first principal gave me some really good advice about, you know, you got to get the buy-in. And I really focused on those primary grades of K1 and 2 my first couple of years just to get that buy-in. Because once you have buy-in and trust, it, it just goes really fast. It's kind of like the old adage. You know, I think some things are old adages because they work. You have to go slow to go fast. And in teaching, that's really at the beginning of the year, just laying out the expectations, being consistent in your approach. And that's how you build a successful program. And um, right now, for one of my classes, I'm reading this book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And he kind of talks about the difference between being a leader and leading. You know, I think in education, we're all in some type of leadership. Every teacher is a leader in the room, but a leader is just kind of a title and a title and are the highest rank. And I think we all, like Simon Sinek, he strives to be leading because that's where you get trust and people to buy in and follow you. Um, so that's kind of my first year. It was, a, it was a learning experience. And I think that the biggest thing is I had to learn from the not necessarily good moments. I think you learn more from the times, the lessons that don't go well than the ones that do. And um, I was lucky to have Matt. Matt was there and, you know, having mentors and different people you can talk to helps. Uh, we both had Mr. Fletcher. He was one of our student, um, when we student taught. Um, and Mr. Fletcher kind of instilled, I, he was probably the first teacher I've seen that truly cared about every kid oh, and how sure. they did in class. And, you know, Matt's student taught him, so Matt can say probably, same probably has the same um outlook don't you matt yeah i mean i mean it's definitely he uh was one of those guys that kind of shaped who i am as a teacher you know i think he was the one that kind of directed me a little bit towards the special ed side because he saw how much i cared about the special ed students in PE. so but yeah you know I, your your program and then my program at jag look pretty similar and and the way we care about kids but also kind of how our our program is structured, you know, I think a lot of, I think a lot of that is, is definitely because he was definitely in our corner and helped us both, you know, tremendously, which is, which is awesome because, you know, we had him and then you and I could basically still keep in touch and talk about things that we could do differently or the same in our programs, which I think is, which is, is awesome. So what do you think the biggest challenge um, your first year was? Like, is there a thing that stuck out in your head that, maybe was the hardest thing to do was coming in new as a first year teacher or, you know, something that didn't go well, but you wish you could have changed or something like that. Uh, probably the biggest challenge besides just the relationships and as a physical education teacher, you have to know you work with K through five. And right. so taking the time to know, I mean, now seven years later, I could probably tell two or three things about every kid from their favorite activity, their favorite, you know, their mom, their dad, something about them. Um, that's probably the big, that's probably the biggest challenge for me. And then the second challenge was probably being authentic. I know that kind of gets thrown around a lot, but kids can see when you're not being authentic and you're not being uh, real. And you have to, when you go into teaching, you have to have the authentic because that's what's reflected in your teaching. And um, you have to be who you are. And I think trying to find, your first year you're kind of trying to find yourself. Like I'm the type of teacher, I lead with more compassion and empathy. And I kind of build a program on kindness and trust, not only with me, but I, the kids trust, I trust them in the activities. And I think it's all part of uh, what works for you. And um, what I've kind of learned and how I've grown as a teacher is you can steal a little bit from each teacher that you watch. So I'm sure when Matt goes to the schools, he can see, well, it's Quincy, Nick does this, I really like that. And then there's going to take little pieces, then you form it to your own, and then pretty soon you have your own culture. But the real, the biggest thing I can say is just be yourself. 
And that's how you go far in student teaching. And I think also one something I think you did great on is you don't dwell on the little things. Like there's, you know, maybe they're not doing something exactly the way it's supposed to be done, but you don't like blow up because they're not doing exactly right. I think that is, speaks highly of, I think a lot of that has to speak highly of, of you. And then also with Mr. Pletcher having that impact on us and he never really, I mean, the only time he would ever get, you know, he meant business is when he pulled his lawn chair out to sit down yeah. with everybody on the spot. Yeah. And, but he's never yelled. Like I never remember him like yelling at people. And I think that was kind of my biggest takeaway with him is he never really raised his voice at people. And no, and the kids, and that's what I think kids get more out of by watching you. Um, they'll see how you respond to us. Say you're having a behavior issue. They'll all, kids, they might, you might not think they're paying attention, but they're watching how you're going to respond to that. Kid. And then I think if you blow up or you get angry, that kind of sets the environment that it's okay to act like that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I preach over and over, you know, just doing the right thing, doing things better, leaving it better than you found it. Because one time I was on an airplane and I saw this quote and it said, as common courtesy, please leave it better than you found it. And so ever since that, in my program, I tell the kids that every day. So if you're in the station, pick it up better than you found it. You're better than you were yesterday. If I set you out five times yesterday, hey, come in today, let's try to do four. And those realistic goals, and I think that's what, you know, helps lead to a good culture and success, kind of like as you stated, just, you know, being true to what your value system. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I think, you know, for me, one of the things I got knocked on all the time in Emporia was when I didn't have a loud gym voice. Yes. But then when I uh, got to to Mr. Pletcher, you know, he said, you don't need a loud gym voice. You just need to be able to change your t pitch and your tone when they know you're serious or something like that. So. And when kids, re and when kids, when you have that trust and you walk in front of the room, the students will be quiet just from that mutual respect, which takes time to build. And that kind of goes with, you know, what Mr. Pletcher taught us is that you don't necessarily have to be the loudest in the room, you know, because um, I'm naturally an introvert. And so that's not even my personality. And one of the quotes I like from introverts, you know, in a gentle way, we can shake the world. And I think both, both of us do that a lot. We might necessarily be out in the front, but we're doing a lot of things in the background that are making, you know, physical education better. Yeah, and this is, so what do you talk about when your kids, you know, we, we have kids that, you know, obviously my adaptive P kids that have, that have been in your pre program or kids that aren't considered the quote unquote athletes or things like that. Like, how do you incorporate them to be successful? And, you know, and I, and I think you do a good job of that. And, but just, um, you know, there's kids that aren't going to be athletes growing up. They're not going to play middle school sports or high school sports, but how do you keep that positivity and connection with them? I think the first thing, um, all kids, all kids want to be treated the same. And I think when you start with that, um, every, that everything else from there is just kind of different strategies, um, ad adaptations, modifications, um, not being afraid to ask, because I know if I need help with a certain student that I wasn't sure, I know I have you that I can ask, hey, Matt, how can I adapt this activity so the kid can be successful? And I think part of physical education is all activities, some kids should experience some type of success. and so. Once you can experience success, I think that's when you can start to challenge them. And I always preach, you know, just try it. Try it, give effort. You know, a lot of things, a lot of good things happen when you try, show up and give effort. Um, and then just between different training activities and then deliberately partnering certain kids up, you know, I think are some key strategies to incorporate the inclusion and making sure like your podcast, all kids can play because all kids deserve to play. Yeah, and I think one thing I think you do a good, good, uh thing of is you know I think is you you provide them multiple options to do something like you don't care if they're shooting baskets with a basketball or a softball or you know gator skin ball they're all getting the same skill but they might be have different options of equipment which I think is which is awesome yeah and that's that's a strategy you know it, kind of, it goes to choice when students you know even adults have a choice they feel like they're they're the ones that came up with it and when students have a choice it just you know makes them successful and they can try different things so uh, yeah that's a good point Matt. yeah you know, and i think you know when we look at the grand scheme of physical, physical education you know as they get older we want them to find something that they want to be able to do for the rest of their lives and i think exactly. you know, if they have a bad experience in elementary school 
you know, they're not going to want to be physically active and you're going to have kids that go home and don't go outside or don't do anything. And I think, you know, and when they get older in middle school and high school, it's more team sports. And then later in high school, it's life, life skills and lifetime sports. But I think as elementary teachers, you know, we need to try to make sure that they understand the value of importance of physical education and, and trying to guide them to find something that they can do. I'm, I'm not asking you to be a basketball player. You know what I mean? Like what but can life skills, right? What can we do? You know, can you, well, I'm not asking to be a basketball player, but when you're 35 and you have a kid, can you go out to the driveway and play basketball with your kid in the driveway? Like if that's, if you can, then that's all we are asking out of you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, that, and that's, I think physical education provides the best, it's a great way to teach like use kids life skills that, you know, sometimes in, in a work environment, you're not going to like everyone you work with in PE class. You might not like your partner, but you have to learn how you can work together. And the biggest thing that I always teach, you're going to disagree. I'm going to disagree with you about things, but it's listening to the other person and being able to come up with a compromise or sometimes you can't, but you still got to work together. And I think in P physical education class, we're the prime. We set that tone early, yeah. you know, for and life. I, and I think, talking about you know getting along with people you don't you know you have to work with people you don't get along with and I think that's kind of you know we talked to some teachers are like well this kid can't be next to this kid and I'm like well what are we teaching them in life you know what I mean like we need to be able to say you know you two don't get along or you two are arguing about stuff you know and I think PE is a good place to say you two are going to be partners and we're going to see if you can work together you know sometimes it blows up in your face but we can't just teach kids to ignore their problems with people and the rest of their lives. And that's one of those things, the first time you do it, you, it might blow up, but, and just like when I first tried to play any type of competitive, mm -hmm. considered competitive game, oh, it went, it did not go very well my first year. But now I can play the game and just before spring break, before we went to distance learning, I would play games and after the games, the kids would go to the other side and say, they say GG, that means good game, I learned that. Uh, yeah. And they go shake hands. And I, I sit there and I'm like, wow. And that doesn't, it, it just happens over time. Because yeah. after the game, I would go up to the kid and say, hey, good job. Good job. Hey, I like how you throw. And then now I'm seeing the kids doing that without me saying anything. And I think uh, seven years ago, that wouldn't have happened. It would have been, right. you cheated. You didn't do this right. Um, and so that's the kind of growth I think that you can see. And feel, especially because we see kids from kindergarten through fifth grade. And I don't think there's a better job in the world where you, you get to know a kid six years and that type of bond you could have with them. It's, it's irreplaceable. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think people that the kids, so with my, with my JAG Academy kids, you know, mm -hmm. obviously I get a lot of kids that new kids every year. And so that, and, but the kids that have been with me for long periods of time, you can definitely see that shift in them of being able to handle games. But then when I get somebody new, um, it takes it's the time. definitely, definitely takes more time for sure. You know, and I think that, but I can definitely see the change. And when I get kids that have been with me for, you know, and you have the good perspective and that's kind of what I learned from you. You, it might not work today, but you always talk about, you know, you're going to see it later on. And I think that's kind of what I've learned from you is just, and teaching is hard. It's easy to get caught up in today, Yeah. but looking at where is it going to be in the fourth quarter? And I think you do a real good job of that. You just keep a very good perspective every day. And you never get, you're never down on yourself and you're just like, I'm going to come back tomorrow. This didn't work today. I'm going to come back tomorrow. And I think that's what makes you a great teacher, especially adaptive teacher, because we need, that's the type of characters we need in adaptive PE teachers. So. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that, Nick. Sure. But, you know, I think the main thing with that is just got to keep trying. You know, unfortunately, there's sometimes some days that, especially, you know, JAG Academy, there's days where we've had really rough days and there's days where we've had really good days but mm -hmm. sticking each day, each day different. And then if something bad ha does happen, being able to go and talk to the kids, I think for me was the biggest thing is, you know, this kid blew up or he had to leave the gym. I'm going to go find him after PE and talk to him. Just kind of try to build that relationship. Yeah. And it might not click that day, but over right. time it will. Yeah. So. And I think the main thing is letting kids know you care about them no matter what. And I think that's, you know, if you're having a meltdown or not, you know, Kids will sometimes, you know, I'll ask them, do you want to talk to me? And if they say no, I'm like, okay, just want you to know I care about you. I'll come talk to you tomorrow. You know, and that's kind of how we And have they to. hear you. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So I kind of want to shift from PE a little bit 
and mm -hmm. I want you to kind of talk about your your after school basketball program kind of how that started and why you started that or if that you know and then kind of how that has kind of grown and I know it's it's I mean it's it's a pretty big thing going on right now at Quincy. So. Yeah it's it's by far one probably the greatest um, experiences that I've been a part of and it started my first year um, we used to have we were under a signature grant so we had a position called a community liaison and um, his name was Mark Orozco. And so it started with us coming together and trying to figure out ways we could get the parents involved in the school and the kids and experience that they might not necessarily get in a traditional school setting at, at Quincy. And so we came up with this intramural program. And from there, um, the thing I love about Topeka is we've had people reach out to us, uh, community partners. I like, like, you know, local Fire 83, the union, they've sponsored us the last five years. And uh, awesome. they've come to Quincy and they kind of, they bring their trucks and all the kids get to look at the trucks. And then we actually play a scrimmage. Um, the last, mostly we've done basketball. We have done volleyball. Um, and what's neat is the YMCA has been a great partner from either lowering the fee to get us in. Um, we play in the Optimist League out at Seaman. And then Parks and Rec has been really good with us too. Um, we saw the need because you, and you're a coach, so you kind of know teaching and coaching are the same thing. I, I consider teaching your coach, coach, you're a teacher. Um, and it's not necessarily about being the best at basketball, but it's more just teaching them the skills to life, kind of that we stated earlier with, you know, with practice. You got to make sure you show up to practice on time. You got to have the correct grades. You got to act right in school. You can't have behavior problems. And, you know, there's been some students that we've had to let go on the team because they didn't have, um, they didn't follow those expectations. And there's been a lot more students that have risen up to following those expectations. They can be part of a team. And, I, and I've realized that the kids don't really necessarily care what sport it is. They want to be part of a team and they want someone to keep them accountable. And at first I didn't realize that, but they want someone to say, you turn your homework in and they want someone to make sure they show up on time. And um, this last year's prop was probably the best year um, from the parents. Every single parent brought their kid to the game on time. They were never late. We had parents bring snacks. Um, we had parents purchase trophies at the end. And both teams did go 5-0. and oh. Not that that matters. Hey, uh, but all right. Yeah. Yeah. Winning is fun. Yeah. Winning makes things better. It was neat as we had a boys team and a girls team. And I would probably say we've had one or two kids that picked up a basketball before this experience. And so uh, that created a great a great experience for me. And we've had tons of support from Quincy teachers. Uh, I mean, I've had coach, and even we've had some district leadership come to our games, which, you know, when the kids see people they know, they're like, oh, they're here watching me. And I think that's, you know, what's helped this program grow. And I, uh, yeah, I would say it's probably one of the better experiences I've had at Quincy. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, obviously one of the best things you've done is is doing that. and and. I, I enjoyed it because, you know, obviously one of my adaptive peace students got to be on the, on the team, which I think was, was awesome. Um, what do you think, when you talked about accountability for holding kids accountable in your, P, in your basketball program, you know, good teaching and good coaching isn't what we considered soft, right? Like sometimes you have to have tough love, you know, and you have to be like, this is what you have to do or you don't get to play. Was that a hard thing to sell at the beginning of your program? Or, and like, did they kids understand that right away? Or did that have to kind of, you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to talk about? Yeah. It's through actions. A lot yeah. of times you can say stuff, but kids all, they'll, they'll watch and see how you respond to when the first kid comes late, what do you do? Right. And it was tough for us because if a kid shows up late to the game, obviously they can't drive. It's not right. their fault. Right. But part of being on the team is it's your responsibility to get their own time. And I first thought, well, that's not really something we should do. But over time, I realized that accountability was not only with them, but the parents as well. And it showed the kids just the value of, it made the team valuable, that not every kid got to play. And speaking of um, the student you're referring to, um, the one thing that's hard about this team is every year, uh, we, we only get so much money. And we provide shoes, socks, we pay the registration. It's all sponsored. And so we've had to cut some kids. Um, and it's, we don't cut them based on talent. It has nothing to do with their talent at all. 
And the student that you're referring to, we third grade didn't make it, fourth grade didn't make it, but in fifth grade, he came out and tried out and he made it. And that just shows you that type of personality of that, that student that he didn't let that stop him. And to be honest, the, kid, the students didn't even notice the, the need that the special needs that the student had. And I forgot sometimes because he never came up to me and said, hey, Mr. Gardner, I can't do this because of this. And I would have said, oh, okay. But he, ne he never made that excuse. And that right there is the, what the team means to him. It meant a lot to him. And his grandma, when I see her, she still thanks me to this day of, you know, that it helped him realize that, you know, sometimes you might not make something or you might not get what you want, but that doesn't mean to give up. And so that's what sports, I think, can teach, you know, every kid is just not giving up. Yeah, I mean, what, the greatest basketball player ever got? Yeah. Didn't get to play varsity till he was a junior or senior in high school. So, yeah. You know, I mean, if Michael Jordan can do it, you can do it. Yeah, but especially at, when you're eight and nine and you're told you can't make the basketball team, you know, some kids, they're like, oh, I'm never going to be good enough. Or right. he doesn't like me. But instead, he's like, oh, I'm coming down next year. I'm going to make the team next year. And I said, yeah, you will. And then, you know, and he did just, I mean, that, I'll remember that moment for the rest of my life when I yeah, read his name off and, you know, so. Yeah. And just seeing the amount of hard work he put in to, to get to do it. Definitely. You know, and he's worked so hard for me and other people that, you know, he's no longer on an IEP, which is, which is cool too. You know, that's definitely one of the highlights of mine too, for sure, is when the kid can say, I no longer need your help. It's sad, but at the same time. All right, so we're just going to wrap this up, Nick, with some, some questions, all right? Some wrap-up questions. You're on TV or you're on Netflix or something like that. You're flipping through the TV, and there's a show on, and you have to stop and watch it. Well, on Netflix, is definitely um, House of Cards. Yeah. Um, I just finished that on since we've been on uh, distance learning. House of Cards, and then on... Uh, TV, I really like uh, Homeland on um, uh, Showtime. Okay, I heard that's good. I haven't watched it. I'll have to try it. Watch it. Uh, if you had to pick one book for me to read, what would it be? Oh. Um, well, currently right now I'm reading Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Uh, I would recommend that book because everyone, everyone's in search of why we're doing what we're doing. And I think Simon Sinek's a good book. But for people that really maybe necessarily aren't readers, um, I, and I have it. The first book I really started to read was called Make Your Bed by William McRaven. And that just goes over, he was a Navy SEAL and he talks about seven principles in your life that, you know, can help, help you achieve. And I think it's a short little read. And I think for people that necessarily don't like to read, that's a good start. But to be honest, I really listen to a ton of podcasts. Um, and I think podcasts are a great way that you can consume a lot of information from different people. Um, and some of my favorite podcasts, I like Secret to Success. Some of you might know Dr. Eric Thomas. He's a motivational speaker, does a lot of education. And then um, I know you you like podcasts because when you're walking and yeah, so yeah, I, I listen to uh, Brene Brown. She's yep. she has her own podcast. She does a really good one. She has the you know the, the a book Daring Greatly, which is which is awesome. It's one of my favorites. Yep. She and has then, something on Netflix too. Yeah, she has a Netflix really special. Good. Yeah, and I listen to some um, hunting and fishing ones, so that's a little yeah, out of it. Yeah, get your interest. That's, your yeah, interest. that's right. You got to keep your interest when you're running and not listen to your mind about the pain in your body. So uh, you kind of talked to a few of your favorite memories, but what are some of your favorite memories of your teaching career? Uh, thinking about this, uh, it's funny because, you know, we go back and you see kids we've had in the past. I'm always like, what's your favorite thing about uh, the PE when we had PE at, at Quincy? And they never say any activity. Like, they don't say, oh, when we played battleships or um, any game. It's always an experience or something I said to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's really caused me to, especially this year, to not necessarily worry about, oh, I got to get through this lesson. I got to finish this. I got to move to this activity. I've really taken time just to talk to the kid. It seems simple, but just taking time to talk to them. And so probably my two favorite experiences are, um, last year we took the kids on the basketball team to a KU women's game. And we took them down field house and walked around. And that by far was probably the experience I'll never forget and they'll never forget. And then also last, no, two years ago, we took a group of students to K-State. They have like a career fair where they have different, you can take kids up there and they have different um, things from like agriculture, 
to bakery and just ex showing them the exposure to what a college campus is and that you can major in something you're interested in. Probably my two favorite experiences at K-State and then going to the KU women's basketball game. Awesome. Um, kind of talked about this a little bit, but what's if you could give one piece of advice to first-year teachers, what would it be? Um, kind of what we say, you know, be you. There, there, and there's no, and I always, Simon Sinek talks about this, there's no winning in teaching. And so it's not a competition between you and the other teacher. And what, what I've kind of learned is success leaves clues and kind of what we stated earlier, you can steal a little bit of stuff from everyone and make it your own. Um, but some practical things are try not to overthink things, keep your perspective, and remember, just be patient. And so probably my biggest three pieces of advice. Yeah. And, you know, we don't know if your students will ever hear this podcast, but if they do, you know, what, what, uh, what advice would you give them or your parents right now in this uncharted territory of this COVID-19, not sure if we're going to have kids to start off in August and stuff like that? Well, as a PE teacher, my advice is try to, you know, stay active so you can stay mentally, uh, mentally sharp and physically for your both mentally and physical health. But on the personal note, it's kind of, I've kind of taken this time, you know, so far, I think everyone's kind of going through their own, their own type of time with this. Um, it's really just control what you can control. And with students, you know, I would tell them, try to find one or two positive things you can do around the house, you know, pick up, uh, help your mom, help your dad, your grandma. Um, but kind of on a, you know, a more personal note for adults, um, I'm trying to use this time to come out. I pick some things to come out better. So not only physically, but with, you know, weight loss, mentally, just try to come out better than when I went in, in a tough situation. And I think that's all we can do is make the best of it. Um, you're spreading positivity through podcasts. So I think just spreading positivity. Yeah. Well, well man, appreciate you. And uh, I thank you for being on here. You have anything else you want to say before we, uh, in this podcast? No, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you, Matt. I'm ready to see where this podcast can go. And I'm just glad to be, uh, you're able to interview me today. You bet, man. I appreciate it, man. We, like I said, like people said, we've been friends for a long time and definitely one of the closest people I've known for a long time. So appreciate you being on here. Everybody, this has been Every Kid Can Play podcast. Uh, we were here with uh, PE teacher Nick Gardner. Reminder, every kid deserves the right to play. We'll see you all next time.